is Charles Kreiner. I was born in Athens, Texas. That's a little town. I still remember 9,260 <laughs> when I left there in 1964. But I was born there. Uh, that's, it's about, it's right between Dallas and Tyler, about 30 miles from Tyler. We had, uh, we had a very, very interesting life. I had a very, very interesting life. I had uh, six sisters and two brothers at that time. I was the oldest <clears throat> and really I was the uh, father because we didn't have a father figure. And my mother was a maid and the place that she worked, the people came and picked her up at seven o'clock in the morning and she got back at seven o'clock at night. Uh -huh. So it was, and my, of course my grandmother was there, but uh, it was really an interesting life. We did a lot of stuff for ourselves. During my teen years, I worked a lot. I worked with my grandmother. She was, uh, in fact, that's kind of the reason I do the work after 50 years <laughs> that I still do. Uh, anything that grew, she worked with it. I would pick, pick, pick tomatoes with her, or pull tomatoes, uh, pick berries. We would dig potatoes. We would do all those things. And so I learned quite a bit from, from that. My grandmother did a whole lot for me. She, she, uh, she never really learned a lot, but she learned a lot. She, would, uh, she knew that I wanted to be an artist. So she would go to the churches and talk, tell them to let me do posters for free now, you know. And every week I could see posters all around the place uh, talking about different things that I had done. Even they had a, a radio station and uh, she talked them in and let me do a poster to put out in their, in, their, in their area. But really an interesting thing that she would do is that my grandmother, we got the Dallas Times Herald and another newspaper from Dallas. I don't remember what it is. But she, we would go through and look at the won't, won't ad section. She would find a lot of these companies, big companies, that were looking for artists. She would take my art and put it together, mail it, and we would wait for what they, they would put on it. We both knew that I wasn't going to get a job in Dallas, but I learned a whole lot because the people that uh, saw my artwork up in those big agencies, they would write us and they would give me instructions on how to make my work better and so forth. I even got one company to say that if we ever came to Dallas, that they wanted me to come up and take a tour through their, through their area. We, we worked at a canning company, peeling tomatoes, and we had about four or five trucks, great big 18 wheelers. And on the side of them, they had uh, uh, Athens Canning Company. And then it had, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, a man holding some peas. And every once in a while, when you drive them around at night, those bugs would hit those trucks and it would kind of destroy the, uh, the writing and so forth. So my mother went to the owner and uh, asked him if I could repaint his trucks. And so he said, yeah, Mr. Frank Darcy, I never will forget his name. So he gave me the opportunity to go and I didn't redraw anything, but I'd go in and I'd repaint the things that was really, really bad. It really changed my life. I, I, I worked there all the way up till I got ready to come to Houston, to Texas Southern. I really knew that I was going to be an artist because my mother told me I was and my grandmother told me I was. So I, so I had to be. Plus, that's, that was something that I just wanted to be. Well, we were from a small town, and the, one of the ladies from Texas Southern, they had a program where the teachers could come around in the summer and go to schools and kind of recruit students to go to the to the universities, yeah. When the lady came from Texas Southern, 
she told me how good she thought I was and that I could make it and that uh, they had a real interest in art department and so I went. So okay. that's 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 the reason I went. But I only had forty dollars. With that with that forty dollars, I had enough to get two sheets, two pillowcases, uh, a key to my dorm room, and what they call a, phys a physical checkup. Really, wasn't nothing but you just looked at you and op had you open your mouth. Saturday, I said, well. I'm going to go and I'm going to find a job somewhere. And so I took the track. There was a railroad track that went straight through Texas Southern all the way down to 45 South, if you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And on the other side of that, that uh, highway, 45, there was Markle Steel Company. And that was a great big company. I really don't know what they did for, for steel but they had a great big sign on top of the uh, the uh, building, and it had it was Markle Steel Company, and it was red big red letters, and it had been painted years and years ago, so it needed repainting. Well, I went there looking for a job, but I had no I had no paint, no brushes. The only thing I had was a, just a little bitty cardboard portfolio with some of my drawings in it. Now this was this was 1964. President Kennedy had been killed one one year prior to that. Right. We had coming on campus Stokely Carmichael, uh, Leotis Johnson, Angela Davidson, all those people. Plus, we were in the situation where most of the white people, normal white people, were scared of black people. Most of the normal black people were scared of white people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so, but anyway, I went there. And they said, well, the, the president is not here. And I don't think we need that sign painted. So, so I left. But when, when I left, there was a man that came in, and he called me back. And he took me back to the office, and uh, he gave me a job. And I thought he was just going to ask me to leave. But he called the plant and had somebody to come up. He told him, said, look, said, Charles is going to start working for us tomorrow. And he said, I want you to go to Texas Art Supply and get a law, get a red, yellow, blue, and black uh, one-shot lettering color. I never will forget that. That's the best lettering color you can buy. Mm -hmm. And I always wondered how, where he got that from. But, mm -hmm. but he said that. So they put that stuff together for me, and, and I had a job. And that's, that's, that's how, it, how it worked. If it hadn't have been that, I'd have probably still been walking Dialing Street down there trying to draw somebody's face for a dollar or so. On Monday, I decided, well, I think I'm, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to, uh, to the art department early to meet any, to beat anybody there. Because I was anxious to see, really, Dr. Biggers, uh, because people said that, said, he, yeah, I said that Dr. Biggers did those, those drawings and painting. Said, uh, and, uh, yeah, he's a black artist. Well, I had never seen, I had never seen an artist, period but uh, a black doctor biggers. So I got there, school started at 8 o'clock. I got there at 7. So uh, Dr. Biggers was uh, hanging some, some pictures when I went to the door. And I looked at it, it was early in the morning, I looked and I said, you know, that couldn't be Dr. Biggers because he has an afro just like me. And he didn't have no suit. I couldn't imagine a doctor without a suit or a smock on or something. Well, this man had a T-shirt on, and he had uh, khaki pants, and he had uh, uh, tennis shoes on. Dr. Biggers and his wife, they lived not too far. And so I started going there just about every, well, I started going there all the way up until he died like a few years ago. But every Sunday, uh, I would go there, and he had two or three other kids that he really, you know, liked. So we would go there, and we solved problems of the world, you know, right in his backyard and so forth. He influenced me when I first saw his work. Uh, he had gone to Ghana, Africa in 1957, and uh, he had done a, a collection of drawings. And they were the most interesting things. When I first saw those drawings, like I said, at the, uh, at the Student Union building, I couldn't imagine why 
the kids would be sitting around watching TV, uh, playing games, playing dominoes, and those beautiful drawings, you know, was, was along that. So they really affected me, uh, so much so that that day, I, when I first saw them, I left and I went to my room and I laid down and I thought, you know, how do you draw those hands like that and why? And I would go back. I must have gone there about four or five times. That's one of the things that I got from Dr. Biggers. Uh, he says, always do, always emphasize your hand, and especially in my work, because he knew the kind, know the kind of work I did, because uh, hands is what you work with, and you always want to make sure that they're big hands because they're working people. But he said something very interesting to me. It didn't catch a lot of lot of kids but it did me he said well he said Charles he says look he says I'm doing this and you got to do this because if you don't it won't be done and that is really the basic for 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 what I do regardless of what things start out it all I have all kind of ideas but it always comes back to the kind of artwork that I that I draw. And I, I used to try to change and so forth. But after a while, I just said, no, this is what I do, and I'm going to be happy with it. When, uh, you know, I wanted to do posters, and uh, I tried every way I could to do them. That's one, that's one of the reasons why, I, well, that, that's when I first started doing lithography because Dr. Biggers told me that I, we were going to get some stones and he was going to teach us lithography, or going to teach me, because I was a freshman at the time that he got the stone. Well, when he got the stones, I thought, well, God, I'll do enough posters for third ward, fourth ward, and fifth ward. And when he got the stones and I started working on them, I realized that that wasn't going to be the case. I was going to be lucky if I get two prints in a month and <laughs> so uh, when I graduated, <clears throat> he told me, he says, look, he said, TSU is a, a teacher's university. Don't expect that you can go out in the real world and get jobs and agencies and things like that with training from Texas Southern. He said, you're going to have to go downtown and try to get with people that actually do this kind of work. Uh, else you never you'll be just a teacher and that's it. So he he got me a uh, interview at Texas at uh, Postes Incorporated. So I went there and there were a place that did uh, post did uh, 24 sheet posters, 30 30 sheet posters, and junior posters. So but they were looking for an artist. So I w I got there a little early. So I was just sitting there. Well. After about 15 minutes, a fella came and he sat by me. And he opened his portfolio. And when I saw what he had in that portfolio, it was amazing. And then when the fella, it was two of us waiting to be in, to go in to be interviewed. So when the fella came out of the, the uh, place where they were having a meeting, he did this. Well, when he did it, <clears throat> I immediately got up because I had been there 30 minutes before the other fella actually came. So, but he said, no, he wanted this fella. So the other little fella got up. He kind of looked at me and, you know, but he, what was he supposed to do? So he went in and they had the door closed, but I could hear him. And they said, look at this artwork. Look at this fella. Look at this uh, painting that he did of this little girl with this, with this sunflower. And he said, yeah. He said, you're hired. Say we don't have to talk to anybody else. So the only thing we'll need to know is when you can start work. Well, when I heard that, I just packed my stuff up, and I just started walking out the out the place. When I got about maybe maybe ten yards, I heard, "Hell no! Ain't nowhere in the world I'm gonna work for that much money." You know, you just y'all are just crazy. When I heard that, I sneaked back in and sat down. <laughs> and I got the job, you know. And it was a great, great job. And I, uh, I did a lot of billboards here all around Houston that nobody really knew anything about, you know. But, uh, but I, I, I did them working for Post Incorporated. 
That lasted about mm, almost a year. Then I got a letter from NASA. Amazing, because mm -hmm. I always loved NASA. Uh, man, I just dropped everything. And uh, I worked there until we landed on the moon. We had like 25 or 30 people that they had hired just for the moon landing. And I realized that sooner or later they were going to be firing somebody. So I just gathered all my comics up. And uh, about a, two weeks after the, after the landing on the moon, and I took them to, uh, to uh, the Houston Post. And they hired me not as a cartoonist, but as just a regular retail artist. And that's how I started at the, uh, at the Post. About, I think, maybe six months after I started the Post, I was drafted. And during that time, if you were drafted and went and, and served, then you'd get that you could come right back to your job. So that's, that's how it was. But when I was drafted, I started doing uh, drawing. Some people found out that I was, had worked at NASA, I think. I think that's the reason. And uh, I started doing comics for the base newspaper. Well, they found that out in Washington some way. And then they, they called. And I, can, I remember my colonel said, uh, said Charles, said, it's some people from Washington. They want to talk to you. And I had my commander there, the lieutenants there. Everybody was trying to figure out what was going on. And I didn't know either. So then uh, uh, they asked me to take the phone, so I took it. And the people on the other end said, we've seen your comics there in the, that you do for the base paper. And we wonder if you would be interested in doing them for the Armed Forces Press Service. And they would print that, and they would send it to all the base newspapers. After I started doing that, that was so big for our company to they let me do whatever I wanted to do. <laughs> so I went back to work for the Houston Post, but I had to be on base. So I would go every weekend and get my, the, inf the stuff that I needed for, to do my ads, bring it back to the base, and complete them, and then send them back. I got letters from all over the world stating that, you know, I like your cartoons, or would you take a look at this cartoon? What do you think about this? And so it was very, very interesting. So, yeah. Well, you know, when the Post closed in 1995, I went to the Chronicle. They hired me the next day to go to the Chronicle. Uh, so I started to work for the Chronicle, and I worked there, uh, I think, until maybe 1999. One day, Dr. Biggers called me, and he says, uh, he said, there's a printing museum over down there on Clay, and uh, there is the, uh, the director said that there's two presses, two uh, lithography presses, but neither one of them worked. They got them from the University of Houston. If, he, if we could fix the presses, mm -hmm. then he'd allow us to come over and print in the evening. So I guess for maybe about a week, every evening, I would come here, Dr. Biggers would be here, and Don Piercy would, would be here. And we'd go back and we started working on those presses. And when, I find, when we finally got them going, then, you know, I did a lot, and Dr. Biggers would come in the evening. And uh, so Don Piercy asked me if I'd like to work here. And so naturally, I said, well, what, what can I do for a museum? You know, I'm an artist, <laughs> you know. So uh, I started work. I started work here then. And uh, I would work my eight hours, but they had a whole lot of parties and things that was going on. So I just stayed those extra hours so that I could work on the presses. So I would be here while they were doing whatever they were doing, and then once they they finished, then it would be my job just to close the place up and leave. And so that's how it started. I've done my whole life of cotton with cotton. <laughs> my grandmother introduced me uh, to, to cotton. She was a, a professional cotton picker. And she kind of loved to, I, I, she, maybe she might have hated it, but she didn't 
she didn't give me that impression. In fact, uh, the other ladies that all of them were about the same age, they all seemed to love picking cotton. They didn't make a lot of money at it and so forth. But everybody lived so far apart from each other, you know, when they wasn't in the cotton field, till it was like a social thing for them to get together and work. But if you look at cotton the way I look at it, it's parallel to us, you know, because we started back in, what, 1612 or something when the country first started, and we start picking, people start picking cotton, okay? Then when that generation died, that cotton died also, but it left seeds. So the same seeds that we have today, but it's parallel as it's going with us. So, so, so when I work with my, my prints and my drawings uh, and my paintings, I let that be a part of it. And I never let the use of cotton be really what it was to a lot of people uh, because I feel that there are some good things about it and there's some bad things about it so and we've always had the bad things about it and one other thing that I, I like to say is whenever I draw it and I'm, I might be kind of unique on this I always draw it as something that's beautiful and unique a lot of artists, they draw it and they do a very, very good job at doing the whole piece. The people are beautiful. The plants are beautiful. The houses are beautiful. The sky is beautiful. But when they get to the cotton, they just take a little white, put it on a brush and dab it. And that's so wrong to do because cotton is, uh, I mean, I don't want to go way out, out of the water with cotton but it is an important thing in itself. And although it's been bad to us, it's the reason that a lot of us are here. Well, <clears throat> when I was young, uh, my grandmother would celebrate Juneteenth. Well, a lot of people celebrated the 19th of June but she celebrated Juneteenth, and if you celebrate Juneteenth, you only have three things. You have watermelon, you have barbecue, and you have red soda water. Well, I found out that when I started school, I went to Galveston. I was taken to Galveston, and the fellow that took us, he pulled off the road after about maybe three or four miles over the the, the uh, causeway and he said Juneteenth no he said the Emancipation Proclamation and I asked him what are you talking about are you trying to learn Spanish or something because neither one it was three of us in the car neither one of us knew what the Emancipation Proclamation was so the fella pulled and he pulled over and he said Charles said the Emancipation Proclamation he said that's why we celebrate Juneteenth and then he said, that's Aston Villa over across the street there. And that's where uh, General Gordon Granger, uh, President Lincoln sent him down from Washington to free all black people. And it happened right here in Galveston. That's why we celebrate with red soda water, barbecue, and watermelon. He said, because when Granger told them that all black people were free, we had nothing to celebrate with. So they found some meat and they put it on an open flame. They found some red soda water and they had barbecue. And that's the reason we have barbecue, red soda water, and uh, watermelon for, 19, for Juneteenth. Well, ever since my grandmother told me back in 1964 uh, that I found out that uh, the Emancipation Proclamation, you know, was Juneteenth and so forth, so I said I was going to do some posters and I just couldn't do them. Even when I remember I told you a few minutes ago that uh, uh, with Dr. Biggers, you know, doing lithography printing, I was going to do posters. Couldn't do it. The Houston Post, they would let me do anything I wanted, but I couldn't do posters. When I went to the Army, they let me do, but I couldn't do. At NASA, you know, even NASA, when we finished that, when we got the, uh, the, uh, uh, 
moonshot and so forth, but they wouldn't let me do posters. So, but it wasn't, it, when I came here, I had tried to do those posters from 1964 all the way up to 2006, and I could never ever do them. So 2006, I was just tired of trying to do them, and I just, just let it go. And in 2006, uh, Betsy Griffith, who was our director then, came to me and said, Heidelberg is renting the museum, and they're trying to sell some printing presses to China. And they thought that it would be a good place to bring their presses and run some copies of things up here at the museum. They had four or five presses in different places here. But I was in my studio. Every once in a while, I'd go out and look at them, get some chocolate cake or something, you know. A couple of days before they were getting ready to leave, they came into my studio and they asked me if I had a painting that they could use. They said the Chinese wanted to see what, what a reproduced painting would look like rather than just the ads that they had. So I gave them one. They used it and said, this is the, art, this is the biggest order that we ever had and we owe it to really f to you and to let us have those paintings. And he said, well, what can I do for you? And, you know, I didn't say it, but it just came out of me, do those posters. And that's where those posters came from. They said, okay, you provide us with a CD with the complete poster on it, and we'll print 2,500 posters for you every year. And so they did that for six years. So you can imagine, the only thing they wanted was that make double sure that I didn't sell them, that I gave them away, you know. And it's the most amazing thing because all the time that I was trying to do them, I couldn't do them. But then when I got here, not only did I get the posters, but then when kids would come through, white or black, purple, Hispanic, whatever, I would ask them, do you know what the Emancipation Proclamation is? And I would give them a poster, you know. So it, it, so it came a lot further than what I actually wanted to, to happen. So I guess, you know, in, in, in all, if you try to do whatever you want to do, if you try to do it and give it all you got, then, you know, I guess the good Lord will step in and he'll, he'll do, take it a lot further than what you could. When I teach, I try to teach people that what might be exciting to you about it might be exciting to somebody else about it. And there's always something. If you can juggle somebody's, you know, brain just a little, then you can pull something from them as far as teaching. And if you can do that, then you have them. You know, you're like God with a print because you draw on it just like the stone we did a few minutes ago. You create it, you create it. And then when you're creating it, a lot of things you leave because you think that they're good and they'll, they'll go f a long ways as far as the print is concerned. A lot of the things you look at and you start drawing it and you think, mm, it's not gonna work. So you erase it. So it's kind of like creating, creating people or whatever. I would imagine the good Lord says, now nah, I'm gonna take this one. I'm going to keep this one. You follow me? But then they also live much, much longer than we do. And that's what I try to tell people when I'm teaching them or whatever about artwork. Always try to use the best paper you can use and always do your best work because one, long after you're gone, it'll still be here. It'll outlive you for generations after generations.